I think that, you know, a lot of these strongman appeals are, are sort of emotionally linked issues. So globalization and migration are not exactly the same thing, but they're, they're related and they're to do with a sense of loss of control of the nation, that we had this nation that kind of, to some extent, controlled its own destiny. And now it's part of this big globalized economy and jobs are being shipped away and disappearing and our borders are crumbling. That sort of emotionally it is of a piece. And so America First contains a migration element, but it also contains a very strong element of protectionism, saying, you know, bring, bring the jobs back, etc. And then if you look at some other things that are happening in the world that aren't strictly related to it, but that feed in, like, like the pandemic, which suddenly makes people focus on uh, the fragility of supply chains, and goodness, does it make total sense to have whatever, you know, a, I can't remember the precise stat, but 80% of our personal protective equipment made in, in China, so, there's, so th those kinds of arguments are also coming in, plus the growing geopolitical rivalry where people begin to, even on the kind of liberal pro-globalization and in economics, begin to say it doesn't make sense to be this dependent on a country that may be an adversary. And we've seen with Russia that actually economic relations which were built up, which we thought probably unbreakable. Um, the Europeans, fact, which the Europeans Absolutely, yeah. The Americans did not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah actually get broken by geopolitics. And so obviously people begin to think, well, may that, might that happen with China? Yeah. Interesting, of course, though, that that is only happening with the advanced industrial democracies in Russia. It's not happening at all with the developing countries in, in Russia, even though the, the, those features of nationalism, protectionism are found in those countries too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's one of the most interesting things about this crisis is that our initial assumption in the West was, whoopee, you know, we've united the world against Russia. And then you look around. No, you have. And no, you haven't. And actually, I mean, this stat that at the UN, 50% of the world's population did not vote. OK, I mean, that's partly because India and China are about 40%. Yeah. But, but yeah, you know, significant countries that you would classify as Mexico, centrist democracies. Indonesia, Mexico, yeah. Brazil, South, South Africa, Africa yeah. all abstaining. Yeah. And I think it's, it's for complex reasons. I mean, but... I, I'd point to a couple. I mean, one is that they will say, look, you're so horrified by what's happening in Ukraine, but, you know, America invaded Iraq. Uh, there was a lot of people killed there, you know, and there, there are other vi terrible violence going on that's not getting the headlines. So they'll say you're being a bit hypocritical. And, and there's some truth in that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's not an easy argument to completely dismiss. Yeah. And they will also say, oh, and by the way, these sanctions that you're imposing will have a cost on us because it's raising the, the price of energy. The While price the Europeans of, still buy gas. The price of food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think also there's a geopolitical thing that, that at some level they don't really want to go back to a unipolar world. So they think, um, you know, if the U.S. actually does effectively uh, crush Russia or cut them off from the world, then, you know, even if we don't approve of what Putin's doing, he's kind of another option in the way that China's another option. Yeah. And they think, well, maybe one day the U.S. will disapprove of us and they will do the same to us.